Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. My name is Tony Fisher. I'm grateful to have you with us this morning, uh, either live at, at 10 o'clock on Sunday or anytime you have dialed in to, uh, to find the service. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. It's great to have uh, here in the sanctuary uh, Daniel Goodsit in the AV uh, room and John Forsyth, our technology chair, always uh, making sure that what we do here goes out to you uh, in good shape. It's wonderful, as always, to have Stu Shelton uh, here at the piano, and I'm very grateful this morning to have my comrade in arms here in the question service, Catherine Costello, who will add to the welcome. I, I found myself uh, feeling like I'm not in such an empty space this morning. Uh, just the promise that we will be together again soon makes it feel better in here this morning. Um, I'm a Maryland girl, and so it's kind of like the emergence of the cicadas that are expected. I almost feel like we're ready to emerge and be together again, so it's a nice feeling. Well, um, if you're new to us this morning, welcome. And. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of the wonderful, excellent things that happen in this congregation. And whenever I read these announcements, it, it always strikes me how positive and uh, comforting, in a way, a lot of our announcements are. For example, uh, Mindful Monday and Wonderful Wednesday. So speaking of which, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., our Mindful Monday Forum will feature Eddie Tabish. Chair, Board of Directors of the Center for Inquiry. And he's going to speak about the makeup of the current Supreme Court and how that potentially threatens the separation of church and state. Tough topic, but definitely one that needs to be talked about. This Wednesday evening, Wonderful Wednesdays, will present the last of three sessions on our living tradition, the past, present, and future of Unitarian Universalism with Tony. And so if you enjoy this sermon this morning, boy, oh boy, you should follow it up with Wonderful Wednesday. On Saturday the 22nd, Zen teacher Laurie Lyons is back with another Meditate and Create program in the pavilion. If that's not enough, then there's always the daily Gentle Yoga with Lois and the Tuesday afternoon Mindful Meditation online. So if you're new, please let us know that you're out there and we would love to connect with you. Today can be thought of as part two of the question sermon. Apparently, your thirst for asking questions and seeking answers spilled over from the last question sermon that took place in April when uh, Lena Neal served as the associate to, uh, to Tony, and Tony did an admirable job of offering thoughtful answers about Unitarian Universalism. I'd like to provide a unifying thread for the service today, and that is to offer Alvin Toffler, the author of Future Shock, The Third Wave, and Power Shift, as a guru of sorts, because he spent his lifetime as a futurist trying to provide answers to some of our biggest questions. I would like to invoke him to be with us this, this morning in spirit. He died quietly in his sleep in June of 2016, before the election, and I don't blame him for that. He did his part in trying to help us to understand the upheaval we're experiencing and probably thought, I'm out of here. Today is May 16th, 2021. I was born on May 16th, 1945, so yes, this is my birthday. Since we've been informed by our membership committee that our median age is 76, I stand here as the embodiment of our middle point today. In 1970, when I was 25 years old, I first read Future Shock because it had just come out. It has been the single most powerful book in my life. It was a bold projection of the social changes that might happen in my lifetime. And as I have aged much more quickly than I anticipated, I have watched most of what he foresaw come true. And so, with the spirit of Toffler sort of looking over our shoulders this morning, let's enter into a service of questioning and seeking answers. 
Questions will be particularly oriented to our UU beliefs and practices, but all of them can be examined in a larger context. And now let's settle into this time of worship with the morning prelude. Our opening words this morning come from the Reverend Kathleen McTeague, one of my mentors, former head of the Unitarian Universalist College of Social Justice. We breathe the common wind of the earth, no matter where we live, who we love, what language we speak. We drink the common water of the earth, no matter what our race how long we live, the coverings we drape on our forms. We walk the common paths of the earth, no matter our beliefs, how far we move from home, the gold that we carry, or its lack. May we live from these truths, our hearts open to the holiness all around us, and our hands turned always towards the common good. Please join me in the chalice lighting response on your screen. May this flame stir our hearts and remind us of our mission to be truly welcoming, to grow in mind and spirit, and to widen the circle of peace, justice, and love. And let's join together in singing our opening hymn, We'll Build a Land. We'll 
build a land where we bind up the broken. We'll build a land where the captives go free, where the oil of gladness dissolves all mourning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace, where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings, to all the afflicted and all those who mourn and will give them garlands instead of ashes or oh, we'll build a land where peace is born come build a land where sisters and brothers anointed by god may then create peace justice shall roll down like waters and peace like an ever flowing stream come build a land where the mantles of praises resound from spirits once faint and once weak where like oaks of righteousness stand her people oh come build the land my people we seek come build a land where sisters and brothers anointed by god may then create peace where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like an ever-flowing stream. Okay, well, here we are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> it, and I do want to say thank you to the congregation for your outpouring of questions this time around, um, both daunting and uh, inspiring in terms of your interest in, in asking these, and I don't know whether it's the pandemic or, or what, but um, I am grateful, and uh, as I mentioned to Lena before and, and Catherine today, uh, this is a lot like walking a tightrope, so let's see, let's see how we do. <laughs> and I'd like to begin by appreciating you, Tony, because uh, this has no script. This is uh, you, speaking from your heart and your mind, and we appreciate that, and the, uh, the energy that you've given us to survive this past incredible year is very much appreciated. So thank, thank you for riding this, for riding this tightrope this morning, well, walking this tightrope. I, I, I tried one of these, one, during one of these services to actually write my answers out. It, <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> right, so here we go. All right, deep breath. The first section is going to have three questions. And the first is a wonderful opening question. Unitarian Universalists seem to profess dedication to the pursuit of peace, love, and justice. Why? So the, the, those of you who are part of, have been part of the uh, um, Wonderful Wednesdays programs might have a, an inkling about this. Uh, our Unitarian and Universalist uh, um, faiths traditions were born out of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was an upflowing of new ideas and, and a sense of freedom in ideas, uh, pushing away from, from uh, outside authority, telling folks what they needed to do, what they needed to believe. That, that sense of freedom, fortunately, uh, among many of those thinkers, came also with a sense of uh, waking and enlightening to the world around us and then feeling that we have a sense of responsibility to go with it. So as Unitarianism and Universalism were developing in the United States with some roots in Europe, definitely, um, during a time of fomenting revolution, the ideas of freedom were primary in people's minds, but also the sense that with that freedom, comes the responsibility to 
create a system um, of justice, we have to acknowledge the fact that they weren't necessarily consistent uh, with those values as they built a nation uh, on the backs of, of, of people who were marginalized, people who were slaves. But the idea that freedom bring, with freedom comes responsibility, that's inherent in our traditions, in Unitarianism and Universalism. Unitarians, um, in, in one of their first sort of formal pronouncements, separating themselves from the Calvinist congregations in New England, we said, we don't believe in a, in a religion of the elect. Only a few get to go to heaven. We believe in salvation by character. What we do is what will judge us in the end. So inherent in those first times and also in the people and the, the people who were working uh, and, and saw that responsibility clearly as theirs, uh, people who were like Joseph, uh, um, Joseph Tuckerman, who was going into the inner city and, and finding ways to help people who were struggling economically, uh, women who were, were writing for and working for educational freedom, uh, not only for young men, but for women as well, uh, abolitionists during the Civil War, uh, so many of our the people we hold up uh, uh, as uh, wonderful women, uh, role models for our traditions, felt that sense of responsibility. And that's why uh, I think we, we, we hold the idea of justice as, as primary. And of course, living in peace and in love, those are inherent in our Judeo-Christian tradition, our heritage. But um, that, that justice piece comes really from that essence of, of freedom uh, tied to responsibility. I think it was Martin Buber who said, independence is a footbridge, not a dwelling place. So freedom gives us the opportunity and the responsibility to act. Well, Tony, you and I sort of mentioned this before we started, and that is um, being a Unitarian can be a little bit exhausting because... Um, because, and we'll, we'll refer to that a lot today. Yeah. But um, I guess we have no choice but to head into the challenges. And I, and I think I have to ask you the second question. Do you need to be an activist to be a UU? Uh, well, a lot depends on how you define the term, of course. Each of us, I think, comes to a congregation like this with different needs. Um, different gifts and we don't necessarily come with the idea that we're, you know, instantaneously so you're going to be, you know, turn around and walk out the door and start carrying a placard somewhere. Um, and we recognize that within a congregation like ours of 350 members or so, uh, especially one with a median age of 76, that, that um, many of our members are struggling. Uh, with health issues, with family issues, uh, making big decisions uh, about um, their lives now. And, and uh, so with that understanding and, and the fact that we need to hold each other in those places, Unitarian Universalism, um, in fact, I believe, um, calls us when we are able to live our values out in public. And uh, it is, you know, it's been called a prophetic faith. We'll, we'll, I think we're talking about that a little bit, a bit later. But when, and, and we, we are at different points along the spectrum of activism, uh, understanding what's going on in the world. I think this pandemic has, uh, if we weren't necessarily aware, or uh, as, as some people use the word awake um, before, um, we are we're now much more clearly understand that, that you know, African-American children have to be, you know, given the, the, the lesson at home before they head out into the world that they need to be careful about police violence. And, and, and that, is a, that, that sort of opens our eyes. Mm -hmm. Not something we're familiar with. Most, as mostly white, you know, uh, not completely, but mostly white middle class uh, kind of congregation. We, we're stunned by the, you know, the idea that, that families can be separated by a government, our government, at our borders. We 
think about the, the state of our environment, not only you know, in, in, in terms of, of you know, global warming, but how it impacts the marginalized of the world, how they are more clearly impacted by changes in, in climate than, than we are, for the most part. Um, so you, you have to be awake to those things. And as a, a tradition that, that, that values the principles that we hold, uh, uh, of the, the dignity and worth of every person, the interdependentness of all things, uh, the, the, the sense that we must work together uh, towards uh, a world governed by justice, equity, and compassion, it calls us to do what we can do. Um, at wherever we are in that place in, in our lives, it calls us to, to, to take some action that's meaningful towards making the world right. And I think so activists, we can be activists by talking to our neighbor and building a bridge. Uh, and as much as we can by, by going out and standing on the courthouse steps. Um, we can be an, an activist in, in caring for one another or supporting those who go out in some way. So there's a spectrum to that word, and I think, yes, for the most part, we are called to be active, living our values in our lives. I like your use of the word stunned. This past, this past year has been stunning. It has been stunning. And it hasn't just been about... Uh, illness. It hasn't just been about the virus. It's been stunning in many other ways. Mm. And so, wow, we'll, we'll never forget this year. And we'll never be the same, I guess, after this year. Right. But, and I also like the way you said there's a spectrum to activism. And, and I found during this past 14 months that there was an ebb and flow to my energy. Mm. Um, and sometimes you can give more because you have that energy. And sometimes you have to pull back and, and care for the self. And I think as long as you can acknowledge that giving out, pulling back, and try to find that balance, right. you can find opportunities for, for activism. Well, in the third question, boy, there's a couple of words here. Do you see a kind of ideological orthodoxy in the way you use talk about and live out activism? What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, this is tough. I mean, and this is a sort of a current conversation in the world today. I mean, there's, there's two aspects to this as I see it. Um, you know, to be perfectly blunt, Unitarian Universalists uh, have, have been charged, uh, if you, gosh, I meant to put the quote down, but um, David Brooks in, in his article in the New York Times uh, quoted another journalist recently as, as talking about awokeness. You know, there's this <laughs> There's sense among some that if you're not awoke, then you're, you know, then you're not, you're not okay, and you know, sort of uh, uh, doing the, the sort of the cancel, say, cancel culture thing about people who aren't sensing that they need to wake up to what's going on in the world, and and so there's that sort of righteousness on one side that is really unbecoming, mm -hmm. um, when people are at different points along the spectrum and they, you know, this is a long, long haul that we're, we're in right now. So there's that sense of a certain smugness about being woke and Unitarian Universalists are, are, Universalists are really good at that. And I think that stems in part from a, a, a culture that we've also held for a long time of sort of an intellectual elitism where um, we're comfortable thinking about things, listening to things, reading about things, uh, and, you know, uh, discussing them ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. um, and looking and judging people uh, because they are doing something or they're not doing something when that all we're doing is sort of sitting around and, and you know, talking about it. Guilty. So <laughs> we're, you know, there is that I intellectual ideology. Um, and, you know, I, I think what's crawling into the question is also that sense that Unitarian Universalism in some way has evolved beyond some of the other theologies or religions, and, and that too is a mistake. Um, we all have different needs. We all come from different places. We all grew up with different comfort levels. And, you know, minimizing somebody else's faith, when in fact they are maybe out there working for justice from their own place, uh, that, that doesn't, so we're, we're susceptible to those uh, sort of those 
uh, orthodoxies, mm -hmm. those fundamentalist ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that we have to really be careful about um, as we go through this, not to judge people for where they are, what they're doing, but to just to do what we can do. And as a community, um, bind, bound together to support one another in, in the work that we do as a, as a community. I love that answer. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. So um, where are we in the, in the whole thing here? Well, so, centering him. Uh, centering him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I hope you'll join us. Uh, Spirit of Life, written by uh, Carolyn McDade, a very active uh, woman in the women and religion movement in the 70s and 80s, uh, author of many uh, or a few of our wonderful hymns. Uh, Spirit of Life talks about a time in her life when she was at a low ebb and needed to find some, some kernel of, of spirit to help her move forward. So let's sing that together. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free, spirit of life. Come to me, come to me. So I want to center this time of joys and sorrows um, on our congregation, uh, knowing that there are many of you who are struggling right now, who are dealing with matters of life and death, who are dealing with matters of family illness, of our own insecurities around health, about the world. As you are there watching this service, I hope you'll close your eyes and think of someone who needs your comfort, your words. and share their name out loud into this silence. For you who are in need of comfort, I hope that you will let us know. Please call or email me if you have a need or our caring chair, Adrian Katie, or the office there are people who are here for you. We honor your life and your commitment to this congregation, not only uh, your financial gifts, but what you bring of yourself. And so in turn, we can only bring ourselves to you. So thankful we hold you in our hearts, in your joys and in your sorrows. Let's join in the spirit of meditation. Spirit of love and life. Most of us have the wisdom gained over our years of experience and learning to know what is good and what is right. We look at our Unitarian Universalist principles and nod our heads, affirming that for the most part they reflect our deepest values and aspirations. And yet we often struggle to find the will to move from places of comfort and safety toward a life lived in alignment with our stated values and in full solidarity with, with the rich diversity of the earth and all its people. We get stuck sometimes wishing there were clearer charts to help us navigate through the dangers and the difficulties of mistrust, 
hatred and division, forgetting perhaps that the old charts are still good if we would stop, take a deep breath, read them more carefully, and follow them closely with care and with intention. This isn't simply an intellectual exercise, nor is it a journey one can take alone. It's a journey of many hearts working together in community towards something called the common good. The old charts, the old affirmations are still there for us to follow as witnessed by these words penned over a hundred years ago which say, love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Here we All are. right. Okay. Second session of questions. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, to not assume too much um, that everybody knows everything about Alvin Toffler, since I've invoked him this morning, just in its simplest terms, Toffler saw human existence as first an agricultural age, which lasted for thousands of years, and then an industrial age, which lasted for approximately 300 years, and then the information age, which we now find ourselves in. And uh, the, the rate of change, the acceleration of the rate of change is basically what he called future shock. So having been born in 1945, little did I know that I was at the beginning of the third wave, you know, now it feels like <laughs> it's tsunami. And so um, 50 years ago, when he wrote Future Shock, 
He said, we are at a turning point. And that was 50 years ago. He said, we are at a turning point where humankind either tames the processes of change or vanishes. 50 years later, that seems more urgent than ever. So, Tony, what would a UU future look like? Um, so, you know, it's interesting that, that a lot of, I, I don't know, but a lot, uh, I know that there were a few great thinkers uh, towards the end of the, the 20th century taking a, a, you know, a real sort of high level view of what was going on in, in, uh, within our civilization and sensing change, that, that a growing change. Um, you know, Toffler talked about, about sort of gaining control over the processes of change. Mm -hmm. I think it was Thomas Merton uh, who talked about that we were entering a great age of transformation, another axial age, you know, comparable to when, when the Buddha walked the earth and, and uh, uh, Moses and Socrates and, or, or Plato and Aristotle. Uh, a real change in the way that we think about things. Um, seeing an inevitability about that, whereas Toffler, I think, more clearly understood the mechanisms of, of, of uh, economy and greed um, at work in the world and, and wondering how we tame those things. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think it's an it's a, it's a, it's a incredible question that's still pertinent, as you say, today. And yet, I think I struggle to understand how we, how we how we tame that, that the demon of greed, the evil in the world that, that you know, works in you know, very insidious ways. I mean, certainly there are evil people in the world who, who um, are working for their own good and for nobody else's and working uh, off the backs of many, many people and not caring. Um, I think, though, for me, a, a, a future, a un how would Unitarian Universalist see a, a future that, where that, we can begin to think about taming that pro, those processes. And, and I mentioned earlier that uh, many of, of the early Unitarians and Universalists were engaged in, in fostering a, a wider and, and, and a much more available education system. And I think, you know, as, as we all know, we're struggling with that right now in terms of how do, we, how do we keep our public schools, our educational system uh, open, available, uh, providing quality uh, education to as many people as we can. And, and that's being challenged by different fronts who, who have a certain point of view uh, and who are threatened by a liberal education. Um, but that's what Unitarian Universalists believe in, is that liberal education of, of teaching our youth how to use their minds so, and, and how to think critically so that they can confront the change that they're going to see in their lives, so they can deal with it, and the values. So there's a combination of, of, of that educational process where they're not just learning to, to, to uh, pass a test, but they're learning the you know, how to think to pass the test and how to, to think in terms of their own values, connecting the two, mind and heart in the world. So I think a Unitarian Universalist vision of the future would be centered on that kind of an education um, and working towards that. And I think, I think for the most part, I hope most people in the congregation would agree that that, that would be the key for us. As an educator, I, I think there's a great irony now, and um, uh, I feel kind of sorry for history teachers in schools right now, because the irony is you want to, to share what has happened to, to humankind in the past, but what Toffler would argue for is that we need to get our, especially our children, thinking about what do you want from your future? And instead of careening from one crisis to the next, one fad to the next, to become a long-range thinker, because the, unless the future is anticipated and thought about critically and wisely, right. then we're probably not going to end up with what we want. So how much do you teach about Mesopotamia, and how much do you talk about futuring, 
And so bravo to those history teachers that are out there trying to find <laughs> trying that to, balance. Trying to you figure know. that out, yeah. yeah, yeah. So next question's really interesting. What does prophetic you you look like to you? Uh, you know, the, the prophetic tradition uh, in, in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible is, is such a strong and important one in, in the Jewish tradition. Uh, the idea that every once in a while there comes along this, this person who's, you know, a nag, <laughs> who's, you know, sort of saying, you're not doing things right. Look at what's happening here. You know, you're, you're offending God, and, and you've got you to change your ways and start moving in this direction. Um, I don't think Unitarian Universalism is big enough <laughs> to, to be that kind of a nag. Uh, and um, on the other hand, a, a, a prophetic tradition is one that speaks truth to power and continues to do that no, no matter what their size is, whether they're you know, a lone voice of, of a few hundred thousand in the wilderness in, in compared to a world seemingly gone mad. I, I think we have to keep thinking about that future and, and what, it, what we're aspiring to. I know that there's some folks who don't necessarily like the term beloved community because it's hard to define. What is that really, what are, and, and is that really possible? Uh, and, and we all know that, that looking at the ideal of beloved community and how do we get from here to there is a daunting and sometimes a depressing thing. Sometimes we do have to step back and take a deep breath and, and realize that what we're talking about is an ideal, but it's an ideal that's worth fighting for. And and so a prophetic Unitarian Universalism sort of speak, continues to speak to that and speak to how on our day, in a day-to-day -day way we move towards that individually and collectively. So um, we see what, what the world is like and, and how we seem to be in a mess. And a Unitarian Universalism that's responsive to that is one that's active in the world which sort of goes back to one of our earlier questions. We can't just sit on the sidelines based on who we are and what we believe and just be happy in our little comfort zones, even though our comfort zones, you know, are something we can occasionally retreat to. So um, I, I think that, that if, if we truly believe in what we talk about, we, we believe that every uh, human being has a right to the kind of sense of safety and comfort and love and acceptance and, a, and an acceptance and, a, and, a, and a, um, a wonder at their gifts. And until the world is full of people who, who are, you know, in, 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 in a place of safety and peace, then there's, there's work to do. And so a prophetic Unitarian Universalism doesn't think necessarily we're going to get there, but the journey is all, and, and, and we're part of that. I guess it's, it's fair to say, what choice do we have? Um, certainly we can do better than we're doing. Yeah, I, mean, I think for the most part, yes. And, and, I, and I, while acknowledging that our members are active in the world, not just in the congregation, but like you, I mean, volunteering, you know. Well, I didn't mean that in particular you use. I meant in a general sense. In a general sense. Certainly humans must be aware when they're honest that we right. can do better than we're doing. Our, our, you know, where we get stuck is where, where we have our fears. Yeah. We have fear for, you know, uh, making sure we get ours, you know, uh, yeah. making sure that other person who looks different or acts different doesn't get in front of me in line. Yeah, um, and those are real human fears. I mean, they, they go to the ground of of, of uh, our creatureness. Flight or fight? Yeah, and that's a perfect segue to the third question. Perfect. Okay, what is it? <laughs> Alvin Toffler said that change is always tumultuous because you have a faction of individuals not prepared and educated to move forward. They're sort of at the back of the caboose looking backward and saying, no, 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 don't take me forward. I want to go backward because it's not comfortable going forward. Mm -hmm. So how can you use best address 
the resistance and divisions that hold us back from preparing for the future? And partially you've answered this, but... Yeah. Um, I think that prophetic voice um, is critical. I, I do think that we need to take a deep breath and recognize the humanity in everyone. And, and so when I say that, I don't mean it in a grand scale. I mean in our, in our individual lives. And I've heard members of our congregation uh, during this political time of significant political divide, many members of our congregation uh, say, I can't talk to them who's on the other side. And that just can't be where we, where we rest. Um, sure, I understand the feeling. And, and yet, there has to be a way uh, through our organization or our partner organizations where we can begin to, to, to reach out and try to understand and try to be understood. And if we can't do that, then... Then you, can't, you don't need to end that sentence. <laughs> right. So it's, 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 not, it, it's an individual effort to begin to break down those barriers that are in our minds often. Um, because we, you know, we can rub elbows with somebody, you know, at the, you know, at the ball game or something like that, or the beach, or, you know, playing games, and we have no clue about their, you know, what they think about politically or religiously, and mm -hmm. enjoy them, and you know, they have families just like we do, and they have the same fears and hopes that we do, and that's where we need to find the commonality first, yeah, and not let our, our uh, the other things divide us first so that we can have a conversation. Uh, and we're not necessarily going to agree, but we have to continue to have the, the conversation. So, um, you know, I think in, in terms of, of this question, uh, we have to share ourselves. And, and, and that's an education of a sort in terms of helping other people maybe feel more comfortable, less like they're, you know, they want to go, go into the future, mm -hmm. you know, clawing and scratching at a past that really isn't necessarily all that great. Um, yeah. I've heard a number of people say the most painful division is when you feel that you can't talk any longer to a family member. You know, it's, it's one thing to feel like you're at odds with somebody who lives down the street, but a number of people have said it's really painful when you don't, when you feel like you can't talk to a family anymore. But as you said, it's not an option to stay silent. Right. It's, it's, it's more painful to stay silent. It may be painful to, to speak out, but it's more painful to stay silent. And, and, so. the, and the right option might, not, might be to not go to that, that divide. You know, what divides you? You have to go to what connects you. I mean, that's what it is. I've been working on that. That's, <laughs> I've been really working on that one. <laughs> Easier said than done, perhaps, I guess. Tony, I think, I think you need to take a breath because this is <laughs> tough going. So we're gonna move into Musical reflection? Is that this time now? I think so. Okay, so uh, Stu is going to be doing, uh, uh, I guess, his own work on the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, that might seem an odd, seem an odd uh, sort of uh, decision in terms of, of, a, of a musical interlude, but the, the song is an, is an old Southern hymn. Uh, the text of this hymn that we're aware of was written written by Julia Ward Howe, a unit, Unitarian, uh, who was an abolitionist. And this hymn and her text was written um, as a cry for the Union and against slavery. Uh, we don't often sing the last hymn of this, and I've got I to gotta scratch my memory here, but talking about Jesus, the, the uh, the last line of the last, the sixth hymn that isn't often sung, as he died to make men holy, shall we die to make men free. Um, it is, it is uh, uh, from the, the pen of a Unitarian woman back in the 1800s, living on the ground and dealing with what was going on then. Uh, and so Stu will take it from there.
Wow. Yeah, well, it was fun. That was great. <laughs> I don't think Julia Ward Howe had any idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, the last section, putting faith into practice. Um, we'll, we'll try not to be redundant in this, in this because we certainly refer to some of this, but this is sort of, sort of the, the closing chance for you to, to personalize some of these questions, I think. What are the most effective ways for you use to put their faith into practice? And I guess the, the term, the most effective ways, because we all know time is limited, and so uh, I think there's a feeling, well, I want to do something, but I also want it to be effective. I don't want to just fizzle away my contribution, so to speak. Right, right, right. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point. So uh, first of all, um, I think, I think our, our Unitarian Universalist tradition calls us to reflect first. I, I mentioned earlier that we all come to the congregation with different needs and different gifts. What are those gifts? Uh, we're not all, you know, as I said, called to be activists on the courthouse steps, but we have gifts that we have. And what are they and how do we bring them to bear? So part of it is to reflect on what our faith is and, and what is it we believe? What are the deepest values we hold? Um, what would we die for? And then start to think about how we could translate that into some form of action, even the simplest uh, um, outreach of a hand. Uh, but I think it calls us to reflect on our, our, our values and our gifts and then to begin to act those out in the world. So that, that's how I think we begin to do that. Um, so that's the starting point, and, and I think uh, then I think the next question is pretty much a redundant one in, in some ways. But uh, mm -hmm. I, um, and I'll ask it. How about that? We'll switch. To, sure. I'm not, not going to ask you, but um, <laughs> I mean, I think finding finding ways. How, how do we find ways to get involved in social justice initiatives? That was the question. Now, um, again, we're called to pay attention. So in this congregation, we've had many different. Uh, um, we've had some significant alliances with organizations in, in the Collier County area, the NAACP, uh, showing up for racial justice surge, uh, the legal aid uh, um, services of Collier County, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and the Alliance for Fair Food, among others. Um, and all that's really required is that you really want to do something and that you go online and see what opportunities there are. Because for the most part, there's always something on their websites that you can find, or you can make a call. Um, here in the congregation, I think what we're, one of the things we're going to try to do is to make some of these opportunities more visible. Uh, our, our team against racism and oppression, Taro, is talking about creating a little bit of a database about where, who in the congregation is volunteering where. And so that somebody who's also interested or might be interested in doing that could call them. Where are you, where are you uh, volunteering? The Guadalupe Center. And Good. I found out about it here. Right. So the Guadalupe Center is a wonderful place. So if anybody's interested in, in, in tutoring, mentoring, give Catherine a call. <laughs> I mean, so I think we're going to try to create a little bit of a, uh, some, something of a database of who's doing what, where. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, a lot of our members are doing things on their own, which is a, a Unitarian Universalist tradition in right. some ways. So, um, so you know, pay attention to who, where our connections are. There are things going on in the congregation, too. And uh, so there's, I think there's ample opportunity if you really want to. Uh, you don't need me to list them here. Mm -hmm. um, you, everybody here that's listening, I think, has the, the uh, ability to find a place to live out their values. My husband, who's not a member of this congregation, uh, from the very beginning um, said, this place is like a clearinghouse of activism. He said, it's amazing how many committees and initiatives are going on within a small congregation. And he used an expression which I really liked, because I sort of introduced him to Unitarianism. Um, he said, you know what I like about Unitarians? He said. It's not about me, me, it's about you, you. <laughs> okay, that's catchy. I like that. <laughs> and um, that's what brings me back to this place, to this congregation, yeah. because it entices me to find other people who, 
who maybe have similar skills or similar thoughts to mine, and we can connect and be more powerful together. Right, so, right. well, I think the last question is a wonderful positive note, and, and I think that people are going to enjoy your answer to this. Can you tell how you have actually witnessed UUism that changed lives? Give us a, for example. I grew up a Unitarian Universalist, and it has constantly changed my life, which is why I'm here. I mean, I, I heard a call to ministry, uh, you know, when I was 16. So, and I've been involved ever since, and it has constantly helped me change, helped me become more aware of the wider world and how I can be involved in it. So here's a personal uh, testament. I mean, I, Unitarian Universalism changed my life constantly, over and over. Um, that said, I mean, I, 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 I hear people who walk into these doors in our little orientation sessions um, who are there and they say, I, the first time I walked in those doors, I just felt like it was home. Mm -hmm. What could be more life-changing than finding home? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, there's that. There's, there's, there's also the work that we do uh, when we think about what's going on here. If you, if you were to be here in, in uh, not necessarily this past year because of the pandemic, but in the two previous years, at the startup and the first and second year of the Emerson Academy, and seen in this sanctuary and out on the pavilion and in another, some of the other meeting rooms, a young, pe young uh, students of Collier County here for three weeks to learn how to to take a test, uh, to get into school, learn how to write an essay, learn sort of the etiquette of how this whole system works when their families really can't often tell them because they haven't been there. Mm -hmm. What is more powerful than that in changing lives? And, and we know because those students have come back and have, have sort of let the other students know about their experience. Two of those students have created a book buddies online that, that we are sponsoring as a congregation and you know, especially through the work of Bill and Maria McCormick. Um, but this is a program that these students from our Emerson Academy have started where an older student listens to a younger student reading so that they begin to get those reading skills and work with them on that. What could be more life-changing than, than that? So, I mean, that's incredibly powerful. And we have a program where we are packing almost 100 bags of food for the weekend as uh, students are going home knowing that they don't have enough uh, nutrition at home to, to carry them over the weekend to their back in school and, can, and take advantage of the school meal program. We're, we're feeding 100 of those kids and families um, every week during the school year. We're changing lives every single day. And I mean, and that's just it. Uh, there are members of our congregation right now, as we speak, who are packing food for the Surge Mutual Age Project. Um, so, and, and they're doing that because they're of our, their connection here. So, we're doing that. And so, before I before I sort of leave with that, um, and certainly our association. The other piece I want to say is our associations with those grassroots organizations are the model for what we need to follow. We can't do this alone. Um, we are changing lives with the NAACP and with standing up, showing up for racial justice and with the, the legal aid and with Coalition of Amok. They're doing the work. They're there. They're in the community. We need to, to partner. We need to sit with them and say, what can we do? And not go in there saying, this is what we think we should right. do. Um, Guadalupe Center, how can I be of service? That's what Unitarian Universalism is all about. Yeah. And, so, and I've seen this transform lives ever since I started when I was growing up. So it's a powerful tradition, and we could be more evangelical about it, to be honest. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, and then uh, did I want to say something else? I think that's a perfect, pl that, that was a perfect ending to the questions, okay. I think. And, that's great. And Tony, thank you, because that last section uh, gave credit to some, some really impressive things that are going on here. Yeah. And now we go to, guess what? The offering phase of right. this service. Um, because I have the privilege of being here in person, uh, to those of you who are at home, I've got to say, uh, of course it's a gorgeous morning, but walking in here today was really cool because it's being freshly painted and this place looks good. This sanctuary doesn't feel like some closed up 
dusty place. Um, I'm just thrilled at the, the energy and the freshness that I feel in this building. Walk down the hall and uh, Tony's office is, is all akimbo because he's, his walls are getting painted. But I think when you come back in person, you're gonna be really pleased to feel the freshness. A lot of people have been working really hard to keep this place in good shape during these tough, tough months. So that costs money. And all of these cameras and all of this equipment that we're using here as we go into probably the, you know, the hybrid phase everybody's talking about. But it all takes money. And if you are proud of these beautiful gardens and this, this wonderful, fresh, open sanctuary, then open your hearts and open your wallets and, and please contribute because it's important that we keep this going. So thank you for your offerings. So I closed the previous service with a question for you, for you who are watching today. And I know we're running a little late. Uh, we don't often do that. But uh, I've enjoyed this, and I, and I hope you have as well. Uh, my question for you is, where are you? And how are you doing? What can we do for you? And maybe what can you do for someone else today? You may not be in that place. You may need someone to reach out to you. And sometimes that requires you letting us know. So my question for you is, where are you today? I hope your spirit is in a good place. I hope you know that you are loved and will always be loved by your association with this community, your family, and hopefully the wider world. Our closing uh, benediction this morning comes from the Reverend uh, uh, Leslie Takahashi, who I would like to be one of my mentors, but it has only been so in her writings. She writes, all that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us now on the brink of all that we aspire to create, a deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a greater generosity of spirit, a deeper joy in this life we share. Go in peace, go in love. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.